I sat down, took out some sheets of paper, and began with the first thing that occurred to me, without knowing what would follow, without any sort of plan. My characters will go about constructing themselves according to how they act and speak, above all, how they speak. Their personalities will form little by little, and sometimes their personality will be that of not having one. Miguel de Unamuno, Niebla. Hello again. Welcome back. Let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his sometimes savvy squire. Now we have another case of narrative interpolation. A young man arrives on horseback dressed in green with golden spurs, dagger, and sword, and also a shotgun and two pistols. This figure turns out to be, but of course, a woman, Claudia Geronima. As elsewhere in our novel, Claudia Geronima tells her story, which is both romantic and political. There's an amazingly modern feminist discourse here based on the equalizing power of guns. Note how since Sancho has just identified with a woman in his political struggle with Don Quixote, guns also give power to commoners in their struggles against the nobility. Claudia Jerónima reports that she has shot her future husband, Vicente Torrellas, in a fit of jealous rage after she discovered that he had promised to marry another woman. Her description is graphic, but it also refers metaphorically to her honor and alludes to the conflict between servants and masters. I shot him with this shotgun and on top of that with these two pistols, and so I think I must have lodged more than two bullets in his body, opening doors in him through which my honor could escape, bathed in his blood. I left him there among his servants, who neither dared nor could have come to his defense. Did you know? The principal problem in chapter five of Aristotle's politics is factionalism. The politics of this are explicit. Claudia Jerónima seeks Roque's protection from revenge by the Torreyas clan because her father is Roque's ally who represents the Nierros faction, also known as the Lechoncillos or Piglets, whereas the Torreyas pertain to the Cadels faction, known as the Cachorros or Pups. We have therefore an allegory about the tribal instability of Catalan republicanism. Cervantes' view of the factions of Barcelona echoes Dante's view of the strife between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines of medieval Florence. Cervantes' narrative alludes to events in Catalonia around 1600. Claudia Jerónima's short blunderbusses, for example, were prohibited by laws like those instituted by Sancho at the end of his reign at Barataria. These laws were hotly debated. The Habsburgs supported them, but certain groups of nobles in Barcelona argued that the laws had not been properly approved by the courts, the Barcelonan parliament. In fact, the actual printing of these laws was delayed for over a year and a half after the 1599 courts approved them. Remember this intense relation between politics and printing. Like the novel's other love stories, Claudia Jerónima's tale is also a typical Renaissance tragedy involving caballeros and doncellas. Don Quixote and Sancho make this connection when the knight offers to intervene and the squire recalls his master's success at arranging the marriage of Doña Rodríguez's deflowered daughter. Question, is Claudia Jerónima a virgin? After ordering his squires to return everything they took from Sancho's ass, Roque accompanies Claudia Jerónima in search of Don Vicente. They find the nobleman in the throes of death. He tells Claudia Jerónima that she was mistaken, that he was not going to marry the other woman. As proof, he asks her to take his hand in marriage and then passes out. Note how the earlier story of Basilio and Quiteria complete with two opposing clans, has prepared readers to expect a happy miracle here. But it's not to be. Vicente dies and Claudia Jerónima laments the horrific power of her jealousy. Oh, rabid power of jealousy, she says. A mysterious narrative voice now ties this tragic love story back to the political role played by Roque. 
Such and so sad were the lamentations of Claudia that they drew forth tears from the eyes of Roque, which did not normally shed them on any occasion. What is the relation between jealousy and factionalism, between sexual rivalry and political rivalry? Quixotic mission. With which animals did the Nieros and Cadell's factions identify respectively? A, snakes and howler monkeys. B, piglets and puppies. C, bats and giraffes. Correct answer, B, piglets and puppies. Now we transition back to the issue of justice. Roque returns to find Don Quixote trying to convince his men to be civilized and give up banditry. It's an hilarious scene because nobody understands him and Roque ignores him but it's also symbolic of the limits of the law. Note how the political scene takes an economic turn. Roque asks Sancho if his men have returned everything they took from his ass. Sancho responds that they still have three nightcaps that were worth three cities. This is hilarious because it reminds us that Sancho stole three nightcaps from Altisidora in chapter 58. It also recalls the School of Salamanca's view of the subjective nature of value because one of Roque's squires challenges Sancho's estimate. What are you talking about, man? I have them and they're not worth three reales. Don Quixote articulates the Salamancan theory. So it is, but my squire esteems them in the way he has said on account of their having been given to me by the person who gave them to me. The problem, of course, is not just value, but the means of possession for Don Quixote conveniently omits that Sancho stole the nightcaps. Cervantes extends his political and economic reflections on justice when Roque orders his men to produce all their stolen booty, which he then redistributes among them. Problem. Because the goods are stolen, Roque's distributive justice, which addresses an individual's obligations to the community, violates commutative justice, which addresses the obligations of individuals to other individuals. Also at issue is a third form of classical justice, legal justice, which addresses the community's obligations to individuals. This is because Roque's bandits operate beyond the reach of the Spanish state. Complicating matters further, Roque makes proper use of money as a universal store of value, which facilitates his division of the booty. Gathering together that which was not divisible and converting it into money, he divided it among the company and with such legality and prudence that he did not exceed nor withhold distributive justice in any way. Finally, Sancho ironically cites Cicero's notion of justice among thieves. Justice is such an important good that it's necessary to use it even among thieves, he says. But wait, Sancho is also a thief, right? That's all for now. What do you think will happen next? Don't miss it. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.